Chapter 12, let's play a game. After a revelation, the next game can lead you to the location of a murder. You stand with your allies in your bedroom. Anyone know why Dante wanted us to meet here? There's no way Nick was planning to kick off his game in this room. Knowing Dante, he wouldn't leave us in suspense for long. But are we sure this following Nick's game angle will tell us where the murder weapon was taken from? Do you have any better leads? I just think it's worth pointing out that someone could have just grabbed it from one of the rooms and killed Nick in another. That... Feels unlikely. A statue of personification of Lady Luck would be a weird pick for a premeditated murder weapon, right? But if it was picked up in the heat of the moment when the killer needed a strike... True. It's not an ideal fit, but as an improvised weapon, if it was just the nearest thing they could grab... Speaking of an ideal fit, I finally found what I was looking for. Nick wanted you to have this one, so the game got underway. Dante strolls in the room with a garment bag slung over one arm. Seriously, Dante, how long have you been waiting for someone to say that? Uh, it happened the moment acting uh, is reacting, Farah. And any har good hard-boiled detective needs her tools when they're out on the beat. I'm guessing that goes uh, the double for solving a real murder. He unzips the bag to reveal a Sherlock Holmes-worthy outfit with complete uh, small magnifying lens dangling from a chain. I remember Nick asking me whether the magnifying glass was too much or not. I told him no, obviously. Maybe it'll come in handy. Diamond choice. The detective is in, dear Watson. You duck into the bathroom to change, and when you step out, Farah lets out an appreciative hum. Hmm. Nick did you justice with this one, Finn. I've never been able to resist a charming little caplet. A cut is perfect for you. And you look, well, stunning. The inseams are doing a lot of the work, but don't be disappointed later. That would be impossible. John's gaze trails down your new outfit, and he can't help smile. It's sharp. You, uh, look good. Thanks. I just hope I'm sharp enough to solve Nick's game. Then let's head downstairs. Nick was supposed to be murdered over desserts, so that must be where we're, uh, everything starts. You all head to the dining room. A strange sense of deja vu washes over you as you glance at the now empty seats. This was the last place everyone was together with Nick before... Yeah, I wish I'd known he planned to kick things off, though. Given his love of theatrics, I'm sure it was something dramatic. He had engineers tinkering in here for weeks. If we poke around, there's gotta be something. Think, Finn. If I were Nick, how would I want to start the game? Glance down at your hand-tailored clothes and try to put yourself in the old-timey detective shoes. I'd want something I could activate from my seat, but if it was uh, too out in the open, anyone would find it. I'll search Nick's chair, the table, paintings. Chair. You step over his chair, rest a hand on its backrest, feeling a pang of memory of him summoning everyone to this room. I wish you were still sitting here, but what did you have planned for us? You run your hands along the chair's edge and then over the back and the seat cushions until you feel something. Huh, there's some raised stitching on the headrest. Maybe there was a rip? It feels lumpy underneath, though. Like there's a small hard spot on the headrest. Strange. I think that there was one place you wouldn't want a hard spot. Well, I don't think starting the party would have required cutting up furniture. Yeah... We'd better leave it uh, for now. I'll search the table. You and John start at either side of the center of the table and begin working away towards the opposite ends, feeling along the sides. I've got something here. Seems a little uh, like a hidden drawer, but it's locked. I don't know. See a keyhole. You reach in Nick's end of the table and your hand brushes something plastic. There's something here, too. Is that a button? He pressed it, and the sound of gunshot rings through the room. 
The cushion on the back of Nick's chair explodes, sending red goo flying through the air as a puff of smoke erupts from the wall. Houston, we have a liftoff and fake blood on my shoe. Thanks for that, Nick, but now what do we... Good evening, friends. Dante is interrupted as a projected image suddenly flickers to life on the nearest wall, accompanied by a familiar voice. If you're hearing this, I'm afraid that means I'm dead. I've been murdered by someone at this party. Oh, I am very not okay with this. Probably feels way more morbid than he imagined. Shh, he's giving us instructions. To solve my murder and avenge my death, you will need to solve a series of puzzles. Together, that last part's important. No one will be able to find all the answers on their own, but beware, one of you is secretly the killer. And you never know when they might strike again. Nick, you really went all in on this one. Stare up at your friend's image on the wall so lifelike that you can almost reach out and touch it. You never did anything halfway, huh? For once, I almost wish you had. Just in case you need a little help getting started. There is a sound of grinding gears and a pop from the table as the drawer opens to reveal a series of folders. Ten of them. You all received booklets on your character's bio earlier, but these folders contain clues that only your character would know. To advance, you will need to decipher the pass phrase together and say it at the correct location. You pass out the folders which contain characters for every guest at the party, labeled by their role. Detective, femme fatale, the mob boss, that's mine. Looks like I got a big part of... Hang on, we're gonna do this, we should do Nick Proud. Read them in character. Seriously? He put a ton of work into them, man. Literal pages of backstory and clues. I think he wants to make the most of them. Dante holds towards the hologram, still hovering on the wall. I... I think this is weird enough without us putting on voices. I'm with Fem. I don't think it's going to get any less weird, though. Reading them the way Nick intended might feel less uncanny. John clears his throat, scans the documents from his folder. <sighs> Through my network, a, a stoolie gave me a slice of this ass phrase. It goes, Friends gather under a lonely... Only a for crimson to flow when are broken. Okay. So, we've got passphrases with two blanks to fill. Anyone got clues in their folder that could fill them? My file talks about my younger days, getting my start as a bartender. Honestly, Nick left a lot of backstory for me to fill in with my own ideas, so it's pretty short. Dante. I wish I would have seen what you came up with. We played our roles a little that night in the music lounge, but, uh... Literal murder to solve? It's not the same. Yeah... Smiles ruefully at you, gaze lingering for a moment. Thanks, Finn. I like to think I would have put on a good show. Still not sure what else I'm supposed to get from this file, though. I don't see any obvious clues, just a bunch of references to my work. Hmm. You know me, I hate puzzles. Wait, what if this is the clue? Are any of War Nick's in-home bars around here? Ah, uh, there's one just next door. Maybe he's trying to point us in that direction. Wanna come snoop for clues with me, detective? I'm enjoying Lead the way, Mr. Bartender. You follow Dante into a neighboring room with a sleek bar along one side. He makes a show of sliding across the bar and then hopping over, flashing you a grin. Can I get you anything, Sam Spade? You step around the end of the bar and start lifting and examining everything that isn't bolted down. Not unless you've got some spare clues lying around. I'll see if I got anything on the tap, but uh, we're pretty well stocked back here, though. He joined you in examining the dizzying array of bottles, jars, condiments, and drawers behind the bar. So, why don't I make us both something as we go? Puzzle solving seems like thirsty work. I'm game. If you make me something in character, whatever you think a film noir detective would drink. 
uh, a drink on the rocks. A challenge? Fun. I'll shake some uh, drinks for all four of us while you shake down the bar. He starts plucking bottles off the shelves right and left, checking each for clues as he begins filling a few different glasses. Dante, pretending looks good on you. Smile on him and gives you a wink. Oh, you haven't seen anything yet. He tosses a bottle in the air, flipping it over, over, end over end, before effortlessly catching it upside down and tipping it to a glass. This show just gets better and better. Where do you learn to do this anyway? Prepping for a part? Bartending was my first real gig after finishing an acting school. Something you and your character have in common. He nods as he plucks another ingredient from behind the bar. My first six months trying to break into films, I went by different names. I didn't want any special treatment because of my dad, so I started tending bar to get by until my career took off. It was a good way to make connections with producers, directors, other actors. Did any of it pay, pan out? Nope. Didn't land a single gig. Well, except bartending ones. I tended bar at Denoro's Din house. Once, great guy. So why'd you stop? I didn't, or at least I wasn't trying to. Eventually my dad decided I was taking too long to find myself. Showed up a bar and blew up my whole spot. Ouch. Has your dad ever heard of staying in his lane? He lets out a rueful laugh. I'm a Valdez. As, f as far as he's concerned, the family name is his lane. He gave a very impassioned and very public speech about taking pride in who I was, and by the end of the night, everyone knew I was his kid. The next day, I got offered three gigs, two playing drug dealers, and one playing a gangster. Oof. They really don't wait to typecast, do they? Nope. And uh, not when uh, one of those gigs did I land on my own. I'm sorry, Dante. He shrugs. It was a long time ago, and it did get me my start. I just hated that it only happened because my father put a thumb on the scales for me. I bet you would have made a it sooner or later if he'd given you a chance. He smiles as you both sift through the other bottles, examining them and the shelves for any sign of clue. I hope so. Probably wouldn't have gotten fired if that worked out. They fired you? Even knowing who your dad was. That was the problem. Once people knew they started crowding the bar, they never bought any drinks. I can relate to that part. You set down yet another bottle with a sigh. I've been through 20 of these and still nothing. What does a person even do with this many bottles? Try this and you'll see. These two drinks are for Dunn and Forrest characters. He sets two of the glasses. He's been filling aside. But this one's for you, detective. He adds one last splash to a glass and slides it across the counter with a flourish. Hmm. Hopefully it'll go down easier than the last drink I made you, now that I'm off the suspect list. What is it? A, nasty, a rusty nail, plus mint for garnish. Found some in the fridge and I hate to let nice herbs go to waste. You take a sip, it has a strong whiskey taste, called it, then immediately makes your throat burn and your sinuses clear. Wow. It tastes like getting kicked in the chest by a mule. In a good way or a bad way? Is there a good way to get kicked by a mule? I guess that depends on who you are, but yeah, this one's got a lot of bite. It's basically scotch mixed with scotch. That just sounds like scotch. Okay, it's not exactly scotch mixed with scotch. See, there's scotch, and then there's... Shows you a, a squat bottle with a golden label and orange liquid inside. Dembrie. It's a liquor made from scotch whiskey, heather honey, and assorted herbs and spices. That sounds like a bottle that's way over my monthly fun budget. Yep. It's more affordable than you think, but only a few popular drinks use it. A Bonnie Prince Charlie and, of course, a, a rusty nail. Nick actually mentioned in my file that this was the local detective's favorite drink. Wait, your dossier mentioned his, this drink specifically? You take the bottle from Dante and turn it over to find a single word scrawled in red wax on the base. There's a word here. The 
writing's tiny, but it, it says moon. Friends gather under a lonely moon. That has to be the first half of the passphrase. Moon. Look at us. Your bartending days really paid off. So did your eagle eyes. There's to both of us, detective. He picks up a glass of his own and lifts it in a toast. Mm. Sure, why not? Lean in for a kiss. Once you each take a sip, you deliberately set your glass aside. The Dante's eyes widen a little as you start to lean in, and then he eagerly setting his own drink on the bar top so he can meet you in a kiss. Mm. His touch sends warmth radiating through you, washing away a chill you didn't realize you were carrying. Then. He tastes sharp and smooth at the same time, like black cherries and something intoxicatingly herbal. You flick your tongue across his lip to taste more of it. You taste delicious. He kisses you again, nipping your lower lip before swiping his own tongue across it. Glad the flavor's not getting old. He nudges his glass, arching an eyebrow playfully. I can make you one of these if you want. I'm more interested in the tall glass of water in front of me. And laughing, he gives you one more kiss before reluctantly pulling away. Much as I'd love to keep sharing tasting notes. Good at euphemism. Go on. We should probably tell the others what we found and bring them their drinks. Right. You and Dante return to the dining room with your drinks in hand, as well as two for Farah and Jun. We come bearing answer and to one of the blanks and refreshments. A rum fuzz. How'd you know that was one of my favorites? I just made something I thought the femme fatale would like. And cheers to truth overlapping fiction. He takes a sip as you offer the other glass to John. It's been poisoned. <laughs> uh, looks like our mob boss gets a Moscow mule. I know you don't drink on the job, John. I just wanted to show. John takes the glass from you. I will. Just this once. He lifts his glass and a toast before taking a single sip. For Nick and Madani. You all somberly lift your glasses. For Nick and Madani. Now, let's get to the bottom of this. I think me and the tapster here got half of the passcode. Nick left a clue under one of Dante's liquor bottles. We found a, a few things, too. Crystal's the doctor, and she has a clue about her working under the sky's watchful eye. S Sauron, is that you? And Diana, or Madani, our beat cop, has a weird line about her adoptive mother, Diana, being uh, a benevolent goddess. Oh, come on, you're giving me all these clues. The Night's Watchful Eye and Diana slash Goddess. I think that adds up to what Dante and I found. The moon. Friends gather under a lonely... Okay, moon. Friends gather under a lonely moon. I never knew, knew Nick was poetic. I might be uh, not the detective, but that sounds pretty good to me. We can verify it when we speak the passcode to whatever we're supposed to talk to. We still need uh, the other half. Our friends gather under a lonely moon only for crimson to flow when... Was the first one a four? I have to think back. Hold on. Okay. Yes, it was a four. So I was thinking maybe this one's friends, but no, that's seven. So this is a six. That wouldn't make sense. Continue. That could be heads or bones. Nope. Hang on. Steve's file has a word highlighted in it. His piano player dreams that the right person will walk into a performance someday. When dreams are broken. That is six. Mine has a highlight too. The only thing my femme Patel supposedly can't keep is hearts. So she's a heartbreaker? What about you? Oh, I'm rarely in one place long enough for anyone to get that attached. At least I try not to be. That might not be working out as well as you think. Her easy smile flickers for an instant. You catch a hint of surprise, pleasure, and something else you can't name in her eyes. 
Careful, Finn. The flattery will get you everywhere. So, we're looking at broken dreams or broken hearts. Cheerful. Also poetic. <sighs> this one's a hard one. Because if you... If you... The future, we all dream of it, right? But then we also follow life with our hearts. And we dream of... Man, this one's a tough one. This one's like a 50-50. I'm gonna be honest with you. Because I'm thinking of how poetic it is and everything. I'm gonna go with... You can always fix dreams, but you can't fix a heart. It will forever carry that pain and whatnot. A dream can be reimagined. You crack the second piece. Crimson flows from heart. A little melodramatic, melodramatic, but it makes sense. You're good at this stuff. So we've got a passcode. Where does it go? Ain't uh, you nothing in that folder of yours, gumshoe? You skim past some backstory about seeing the darkest sides of humanity struggling to fight for justice until you find a section labeled Intel. Detective, this is a tough case and no mistake, but if you want to crack it, put your head together with your suspects to learn where the lone shark swim. The pool. Pete's the lone shark, right? This might be a clue my character is supposed to get from him. Bara plucks Pete's file from the table. Let's see, backstory, backstory. Uh, he has a secret sweet tooth, uh, some phrases he's supposed to reveal throughout the party. One talks about all his uh, visits to spots where glamour and seediness combine. Glamour and seediness. Glamorous but seedy. That sounds like a casino. As big as this house is, I think we'd know if Nick had one of those tucked away. Oh, wait for it. You glance around the room and gaze lands on a series of paintings across from the table. Maybe it's both here and not here. I think this game is getting near. You're speaking in riddles. I'm serious. Art can transport you to different places, like those paintings on the wall. It's worth a shot. Reading a passcode to some oil paintings is one of the less weird things we've done. There's an abstract piece on the wall. But opposite it, you see three paintings that are all connected to noir films. A dark alleyway, a smoky detective's office, a jazz singer in a lounge. Those have to be something. Hmm. As you lean in to examine them, you feel the weight of the miniature magnifying glass through your new clothes. Oh, come on! <laughs> You lift it to your eye and look through the lens in the corner of the jazz scene. You can just make out the tiny image of a shark. The outfit unlocked a clue. Thanks for the hint, Nick. Yeah, well, listen. A lounge is also in a casino, too, just saying. I'll read the passcode to the jazz lounge. You step up to the image of the jazz lounge and speak the passphrase aloud. Friends gather under a lonely moon only for a crimson to flow when hearts are broken. You hear a clicking sound and the whirring of gears as the lights flicker and dim. The wall in front of you shakes a little and begins to fold backward, revealing a hidden doorway into a secret room. Damn, Finn. Ariot's got nothing on you. You step into a new room, overhead lights flicker on and reveal a room full of puzzles, including a massive r Rube Goldberg machine. I'm sorry, a what now? Oh, God, more puzzles. Oh. Wow, Nick, you're really committed to the... Welcome. You're done an excellent job solving the first of my puzzles, but now a whole room full of brain teasers awaits. I hate you so much. You all jump as the same hologram of Nick appears on the room's wall. His recorded voice trickles out of a hidden speaker. For a dead man, he is way too good at jump scares. <laughs> Somewhere in this room, I've hidden a box which will lead you to the next part of the mystery. But in order to find it, you'll need to puzzle your way through this room, starting with the shelf in front of you. That is a lot of puzzles. Yeah. Yeah. Good thing I've played a lot of escape rooms. Oh, God. I could... Uh, listen, I hate puzzles. 
and especially if you're with other people, I, I just, <sighs> it depends on the person. It'd be fun if Nick was actually here, but being coached through puzzles by a hologram of her dead friend isn't my idea of a great time. Seems like the only way forward is through, though. I could grab a hammer and start smashing things and we, until we get to the end of whatever this is. Easy, Thor. <laughs> if we just go around smashing everything, we could miss the one clue we actually need. That's fair, but I'm no expert on brain teasers. I haven't even won a game of chess since my youngest sister turned 12. Chess and puzzles are completely different, dude. We'll handle the puzzle solving then, John, and let you know if we need a crowbar. You approach the shelf, Nick indicated, and find a strange array of objects, a cigar, a bullet, a statue of gravestone, and a teardrop-shaped piece of glass. One of these is the most durable and the most explosive. Lift it, and the next puzzle will be unlocked. Durable and explosive. Okay. Nothing to stop us from trying all of them, is there? Only a sense of pride in our own intelligence. Let me take a closer look at the candidates. Magnifying glass. You pull out your magnifying glass and begin examining items one at a time. All the objects seem normal until the, you pan across the teardrop glass. That looks like a crack turns out to be a message engraved in almost a microscopic letters. It says pick me. <sighs> this isn't fun for me, okay? No idea what glass has to do with being tough or explosive, but if Nick left a clue about it, that's good enough for me. <sighs> okay, I'm gonna do this without the hourglass for a minute, just do some deductiveness. Cigar. Tough and explosive? No. Bullet. Tough and explosive? Most likely people without the hourglass probably pick this one. Gravestone. Tough and explosive? Tough, yes. Explosive? No. Teardrop glass. Actually, I have seen some glass that is unbreakable. I'm not even kidding. Um. Hmm. Yeah, no, like I said, most people without the hourglass probably, or the minute magnifying glass probably pick that. I'll go with the science me. Without the effing clue. You gingerly lift the teardrop-shaped glass from its stand and a musical chime sounds from the room's speakers. Congratulations on solving the first puzzle. You'll catch my killer yet. Just in case you're curious, teardrop glass, aka Prince Rupert Drops, is formed by submerging molten glass in cold water. The process makes their cores dense enough to stop a bullet, but the smallest crack in the tail can cause rapid and explosive disintegration. Yeah, if, you, if you've seen some of those shorts, right, they, they show that. Like I said, I've, I've seen it. Though, I'm sure you knew that already. Hey, look at me. I'm ahead of the game, technically. Oh, yes, obviously. If we finish this, I'm never solving puzzles made by a billionaire tech genius again. You may proceed to the next puzzle, or if you want a few more tools on your side, you could see what's hiding in there. As the recording finishes, those words, a panel in one wall, slides open to reveal a darkened crawl space. A secret room inside of a secret room. Don't mind if I do. Nick said we could go to the next puzzle, though. A uh, crawl space looks like a do detour. But who knows what's inside? It could be something that'll help us with the next stage of the human-sized mousetrap. Oh, of course you're gonna love this one. Diamond choice. The whole thing with the outfit solving puzzles for me is tilting. We'll talk at the end about it. If Nick went through all the trouble to make this, it's gotta have something inside. Count me in. Oh, Finn. I knew you were fun. And Farah go over to examine the opening in the wall. It's just big enough for both of you to squeeze inside. But the light from the larger room only reveals a little of the crawl space behind the panel. Nick certainly knew how to set the mood. Do you... Think Nick put this here for you? Oh, I hope so. If it wasn't already out to you three, I would have pretended not to want to crawl through. Hmm, I am not about that part. You would have had to hold yourself back if we were doing this for real, with everyone. Hmm, that's why sometimes I envy good old-fashioned thieves. It must be nice to simply do what you're good at without pretending like you aren't. You don't have to pretend around us, at least. 
And for that, I'm more grateful than you know. Rara taps a finger against her lip, sizing up the opening. I'd suggest crawling in side by side, just in case we trigger any kind of switch. It's best to have an extra hand when working in the dark. I trust your expertise on this one. The two of you kneel and begin crawling in shoulder to shoulder. You both clear the door, inching your way through the crawl space beyond. When the wall panel suddenly slams shut behind you, John calls out to you from the other side. You two okay in there? We're fine. Just enjoying our newfound sensory deprivation chamber, aren't we, Finn? <laughs> Yep, so relaxing. I'm definitely not worried about being trapped in here forever. Do you want Dante and I to try prying this wall back open? Calm down, Thor, seriously. Give us a minute to poke around. Nick wouldn't have programmed that panel to shut unless this there was a way out. He was more of a mad scientist than I gave him credit for, but he wasn't, uh, he wouldn't cask of amatillado us. 10 4, yell if you need a hand. And far a crawl onward in the darkness as you fumble for your phone. The space around you starts to widen just as you pull it out and flick on your phone light. Revealing a cluttered space full of antique odds and ends. I think we just crawled through a wormhole into a spare room of Disney's Haunted Mansion. Yes! Charming. A little gothic for my taste, but, uh... I see those dolls. I see them. <laughs> As Farah scoots into the open space at the center of the room, her hand brushes something. Are you okay? That wasn't me. It was a rubber chicken. Thanks for that, Nick. <clears throat> Let's hope he didn't lure us in here just for the jump scare. Both of you begin poking through the boxes and knickknacks scattered around the room, all of them artfully draped with fake cobwebs. I've got a statue of a falcon, a candlestick, butler's tray, some kind of red fish. Red herring, which is what I think all of those are. Then can I interest you in a mystery rock? She holds up an object in question. Thanks, but I've got enough paperweights for one lifetime. When people don't know uh, what to get a writer for their birthday, it's always pens, paperweights, or notebooks. This one has some odd cuts on the sides, though. She squints at it, holding her phone's flashlight closer to get a better look. The base is cut into an octagon. That must be the tool Nick's recording mentioned. No idea what it does, but we'll probably need to get out of here for that part. Get out. You know, I was getting comfortable. I was thinking about picking out some curtains, investing in a nice couch. Faro. I see a great spot for a chase lounge. Oh, chase lounge. Oh, Finn. This place is rubbing off on you. I don't think wanting a chase lounge to spruce up an attic-sized living space makes me part of uh, the 1%. Not yet, but we should get you out of here before you start shopping for private islands. You see that weird little contraption in the wall. She points and you see a small opening on one wall, closer to her, mirrored by an identical opening on your side. It looks like a tumbler, like in a log. There's one on each side. I think we're meant to turn them together. At the same time? Yes, very slowly and gently. The two of you are so close that you can place your hand on the tumbler and you can feel her shoulder shifting as she reaches for hers. Turn it two notches to the left to start. How do you even know that? Just trust me. You work slowly, first turning it to the left twice as she pieces together the next steps. You know, it's been a while since I was stuck in a room this small with someone. Brings back memories. This happens to you a lot? If I had a nickel for every time, I've, I'd only have two nickels, but it's weird that it happened twice. What happened last time? I had stolen sculpture of me, and I was about to run uh, into a mob-connected owner and part of his housewarming party that was very off-limit. So I dodged into a closet, but wouldn't you know it, it was already occupied. By another mob guy or someone friendly? The latter, thankfully, a woman who ducked in there for a smoke. But I was under a minute to convince her that I'd actually come in here looking for her and not to evade the consequences of my burglaring. Did it work? Let's just say that when our host opened the door, she had her arms around my neck. 
and he was none the wiser about my theft. Mm, is this why you invited me in here to seduce me in under a minute? Probably. Her eyes are dark in the low light as she gives you a playful smile. The secret tunnel inside a secret room was enticing, I won't lie. But the privacy does have its benefits. She shifts a little closer, resting a free hand over yours and giving it a squeeze. So is it working? Mm, I followed you into a haunted-looking crawlspace of my own free will. What do you think? I think I'm glad that you did. There's a loud clicking sound on from both sides of the tunnel. There we go. That's a good sound. Start turning yours to the left now. We, we literally already turned it twice to the left. Yes, ma'am. Glance at her in the confined space as you both begin adjusting your tumblers. You really enjoy this stuff, don't you? Is that surprising? No, it's just still basically work. You've got to have other hobbies. When, what does Fara Sabri like to do for fun when she isn't winning over strangers in closets or liberating priceless art pieces? She goes quiet for a moment as she considers the question. The only sound is the movement of the tumblers in the wall. Well, publicly, her only hobbies are drinking and socializing. Well, obviously. But if you went down to the nearest climbing gym on any given Tuesday, the odds are pretty good that you might find a woman named Farah Sahid. It looks an awful like, lot like her, and loves rock climbing. Hmm, good to know. And with that, there's another click from the wall. The panel at the end of the crawl space slides back open, revealing the room you came from. Looks like that did it. We're home free. If you like. She hesitates for a moment, her expression unreadable in the dim light. We don't have to leave right away. Not if you don't want to. I'll kiss her, why not? You're already only a few inches apart, so you lean in slowly, but she is there to meet you in an instant. She kisses you slowly but deeply, as if drinking in the taste of you. Ben. Yeah? Don't stop. You kiss her again, nipping at her lower lip, and she lets out a soft moan, muffled in the tiny room that surrounds you. Then she's kissing on your neck, nipping at your pulse point as her hands trail over your chest. Your heart is racing. You two still okay in there? Do you need a hand getting out? A hand. But um And Dante is knocking on the wall. Nope, we're good. Almost there. That's what she said. You grin it for a look. <laughs> Both of you breathless, and she gently straightens her clothes. Pity, but I'm glad we got to enjoy this little detour. She brushes a thumb across her cheek before turning towards the exit. Me too. The two of you squeeze out of the tunnel and rejoin the others in the main room. Find anything useful? This rock with an octagon base. Octagon seem to be the next uh, theme. Spotlight illuminates a table before you, with a receded octagon in the center. A four arrow-shaped dial sit around the edges, each pointing in different directions. John twists one to point towards the center, and there's a clink. Oh, this one's easy enough. John grabs the next arrow and twists it towards the center, but the second he does, the other arrow spins back to its original orientation. Ah, it's one of these. You've got to be kidding me. First rule of puzzles. They're not always as easy as they look. Unless we break this table open. Hang on. Can I see that rock we found? Be my guest. Far, hand you the rock, and you place it in the center of the table. It fits perfectly in the octagonal re recess. All of the arrows spin wildly until they're all facing the center, each logging into place with a soft chime. Freaking magnets. How do they work? The top of the table opens, and a pedestal rises from it, holding a gleaming metal object. An orb. Oh, we're going to Harry Potter land now. Mysterious compels me, though. Ooh, do we get to tell fortunes now? It's always been my life's ambition to, to age into a mysterious old crone who sends fools to their doom. Ah, uh, that checks out, but I think this is another puzzle. There's a tiny hole in the top. 
Oh, I know what this is. It's a spherical Rubik's Cube. You have to line the holes up in each uh, layer to get to what's inside. It looks pretty delicate. Yeah, the metal has to be thin for the layers to rotate on. So, I could just smash it? Jesus Christ, dude! Do you only have one mode? You're like the Hulk. Hulk, smash. Wait! I used to do Rubik's Cubes all the time as a kid. Let me give it a shot. Yeah, I'm gonna go with Dante. Just let him have some fun. Alright, I'll be plan B if this uh, doesn't... Got it! Jeez, that was fast. I never doubted you for a minute, Dante. With the orb now unfolded in his hand, Dante pulls an antique key from the inside. He passes it to you. Where do you go? I swear, I saw a keyhole in here earlier, and you didn't point it out. By the world's most elaborate Rube Goldberg machine. Let's see if it works. You turn the key into a slot at the base of the machine, and a single marble drops onto the top of the track. The four of you watch as it whirs around the room, triggering her elaborate gears, bouncing off of metal planks that play a musical note. Man, it'd be better if he was here to see it. This is cool, right? Nick made something incredibly cool. Yeah. Yeah, he did. As the machine whirs and slacks, you almost imagine your old friend standing beside you, smiling in pride. Great work, everyone. I built this to be the most difficult recording. That's how they did it. Y'all turn to stare at Dante as he stares at the hologram. Oh. How, who, did, what? I talked to Nick after he was killed while I was on the phone with my dad. At least I thought I did. But what if the person I heard moving upstairs was the killer and recording like this is how they replied with Nick's voice. That would work. I hate it, but that would actually work. A chill runs down your spine as a small platter descends from the room ceiling. A carved wooden box rests on it with a note on top. You'll need this for what's ahead. Good luck, sleuths and suspects. I'm counting on you. We won't let you down, Nick. But I am taking this back in the dining room. If I never see another puzzle again, it'll be too soon. You all return to the dining room where the lights have been returned to normal. Set the box on the table to study it. And it came with a note. You pick up the note and read it aloud. Your next location will be a date with Lady Lug. The box will lead the way. What's a good mystery party without the party? Put on your film noir best and join me for a night at the speakeasy. Where the note once sat on the box's top, you now see a timer beside a keyhole ticking away a 24-hour countdown. I'm guessing this isn't meant for uh, to open until after said party he would have hosted. You've got to be kidding me. Nick planned the mystery to uh, last a whole weekend. He must not have wanted us bulldozing through it in one night. So, we're supposed to just wait? Oh, <laughs> John, wanna smash it? <laughs> yep, no, I'm doing this. John has the box in one hand as Dante wins us, but then he shakes his head. <sighs> I'd like nothing better, but this thing's sturdy. I think mean, Nick built it to avoid any brute force opening. Lucky us. The one time you want him to smash, you all freeze at the sound of a thump overhead, followed by footsteps and a loud crash in the plants outside. What the hell was that? It's like Nick all over again. Your whole body goes cold as the four of you rush to the nearest window. You see Liz outside, standing up where she tumbled into some shrubs and breaking into a dead sprint. Liz is making a run for it. <laughs> okay. Without further ado, thanks for watching. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Head to the description. Plenty of things to check out. Ways to support and whatnot. Without further ado, let me know what you thought of this chapter. Um, so far, it's amusing. However, 
I have a big pet peeve. So, <clears throat> we get an outfit. Just an outfit, right? It doesn't give a disclaimer that, hey, by the way, getting this outfit, like they've done in the past, will help solve clues ahead in pretty much puzzles. It's pretty much where you don't have to try. Eh, kind of a pet peeve there for me, right? Again, I'm not a huge person that, like, loves puzzles, but I would have at least liked to try, right? And so, you know, I don't know, maybe Pixelberry, you could try this. There's apps out there, uh, I don't know, RC is one of them, that literally give you an option to toggle things on and off, or accept things. I, I would have denied, in all honesty, the clue thing, and the magnifying glass and let it be an option right like you know you could have been like well let me select one of the four or go to my magnifying glass i'm just saying so yeah no like i said i watched a video a long time ago where a person did that and they and they made it and they kept dropping it on the ground and they literally did a bunch of stuff to it and it would not break however there was this little teeny tiny like bead ending at the tail of it that once the person snapped it off they dropped it in this like just simply dropped it like they did before and it shattered it was as fragile as like a regular piece of glass but until they took off that tip on the tail no that, that thing was seriously indestructible like they did a bunch of stuff to it so it's very fascinating science i love it um but otherwise thanks for watching catch you all later peace out